All right, open your Bibles, if you would, to Mark chapter 4. And uh, I, I figured out if I talk in a radio voice, my voice does okay. Uh, so I might preach like that this morning. But uh, 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 Mark chapter 4, uh, this is actually the passage of Scripture that the Lord used to call me um, it just to confirm my call into missions. I just want to share some thoughts from it this morning. <clears throat> I'm going to, we're not necessarily going to go th- uh, that route with it, but uh, I just want to share some thoughts from this passage of Scripture, and I, I trust it will be an encouragement and, and hopefully a conviction to us. And and uh, But Mark chapter 4 is where we'll be reading. I'm going to start in verse 35. Uh, before I start reading, though, I want to give a little context of what's going on. Uh, Mark chapter 4, the beginning of the chapter, Jesus is teaching in parables. And, of course, he, he often did that, and he had a multitude of people there, as often was the case. And uh, here he is teaching in, uh, in parables, and we uh, see at the beginning of Mark chapter 4 a very familiar parable. And probably most of us in this room have heard it before and have, have heard it preached on. I, I would assume that be the case. But just to recap, <clears throat> it's the parable of the sower and the seed, where uh, there's a man that's out sowing, and... And some of the seed falls on good ground, some on thorny, some on stony ground, and, and some on hard ground. And, and of course, the, the seeds that fall on the hard ground, the birds come and eat it. And uh, the other seeds uh, on the st- stony ground, it grows a little bit, but then it dries up and withers. And um, if it falls among the thorns, it grows, but then the, t- the, the thorns choke it. And then some of it falls on good ground, and it grows and brings fruit. And, of course, the disciples have no clue what Jesus is talking about. And so they come to Jesus afterwards, and they, they tell him, Lord, I, we don't know what you're talking about. What does it mean? And I'm glad they asked because that way I don't have to. <laughs> but he then explains to them that the seed is the word of God and, and the ground is our hearts. And, of course, the different kinds of people that receive the word of God and and the different growth, and and some bring forth fruit. And then he goes on and and teaches them in in, uh, three or four other parables that are recorded here in Mark chapter 4. And then that's where we pick up this account in Scripture. Uh, So we're going to pick up at verse 35, where the Bible says, And the same day when even was come, he saith unto them, Let us pass over unto the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship. And there were also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him, and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose, and rebuked the wind, and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said one to another, What manner of man is this, that even the wind and the seas obey him? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd help me as I just share some truth from your word. Uh, Lord, guide my words and thoughts, and I pray that you'd speak to our hearts this morning. And uh, Lord, I pray that you just, whatever it is that you want to speak to us about, uh, help, help us to be open to it and to to hear and and receive the Holy Spirit's prompting and and help us not to close our ears to that and uh, Lord just uh, strengthen my voice this morning and and I pray that this would just be an encouragement and a blessing and and work in our lives we love you thank you for loving us in Christ's name we pray amen so here in Mark chapter 4 Jesus gets done with uh, teaching the multitudes and then teaching uh, some of his disciples, and, and it was the 12 and other others of his close followers. I don't know how many were there. <clears throat> but they they finish up, and at the end of the day, the Bible tells us the same day when even was come, so in the evening there, uh, Jesus looks at his disciples and he says, hey, let's get in the boat, let's pass over unto the other side. And that's what they do. They get in the boat and they start sailing. Now, we just read it, but... You know, the storm comes, and the disciples are afraid, and they come and wake Jesus. And, of course, all he does is say, peace be still. Uh, But 
I want you to look first of all at verse 35 here. Where the Bible says, In the same day when even was come, he saith unto them, Let us pass over unto the other side. I want you to notice here that Jesus didn't look at the disciples and say, Hey, let's go sailing. He didn't say, Hey, let's go fishing. Uh, let's go for a joyride. Jesus said, Let us pass over unto the other side. You know, Jesus had a destination in mind for the disciples that day. He knew where he was going. He knew where he wanted to take them. And he had a place in mind. Now the disciples would have enjoyed going out on the boat just for fun. That's a very enjoyable experience. I've gotten a few opportunities now to go out on, on boats. And man, it's fun. To get out on the water, I just love it. I know some people get seasick and, and that's not their thing. But <clears throat> I don't. And I love it so much. Uh, the first opportunity we had was down in uh, Plymouth, Massachusetts, and a pastor actually paid for us to go on a whale watching boat. Man, that was the coolest thing ever. It's a 100 foot boat, and we're going out in the ocean, and you go about an hour out, and that's on open throttle. I mean, they were moving. And we went about an hour out, and they knew where the whales were there um, hunting, and and they apparently the whales come north to to the the waters on the Atlantic there and all they do is eat that's all they do the whole time they're there is eat and then they migrate south and they and they fast which is just kind of weird I don't get it but that's what they do and so man they were just there and they were feeding and we got to see five whales and, and there were two calves with their two moms and then one other whale and uh, there were a couple that they could identify by different marks on their tails and stuff and uh, man, it was such a cool experience. And since then, I've gotten to go out on some boats, not on the ocean, but on some lakes. And it's always so much fun and so enjoyable. But that's not what <clears throat> that's not what Jesus was doing here with the disciples. Now, I'm sure they would have enjoyed that. Uh, most of the disciples were sailors. And many of them were, I say most, but uh, several of them were, were fishermen. That was uh, their trade. That was their family business. You know, if, if Jesus had said, hey, let's go fishing, man, they would, have, they would have been all on board for that. I mean, that was their livelihood. They, I, mean, I haven't had much opportunity in my life to go fishing. I've caught one fish in my entire life, and it was when I was like seven. So <laughs> um, it was like that big. Uh, that is my entire fishing experience. Um, this, this, you don't want to fish this, the river in the city I grew up in in Brazil. Uh, at one point in the world, it was considered the most polluted river in the world. So, yay us. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but, you know, that's not what Jesus said. He said, let us pass over unto the other side. And he had a place he wanted them to go. Uh, Jesus had a destination. Now, I don't know that the disciples knew where that was. You know, the other side is kind of vague. I could say, let's go to the other side of Lake Michigan. Now, that's on the other side of Michigan. I understand that. Uh, what lake? Are we near a lake here? Are we by Huron? Okay. So let's say I said, let's go to the other side of Lake Huron. I didn't look at a map before today. So <laughs> I don't know what's on the other side of Lake Huron. I think New York is probably down there or Ohio or something. What? Huh? Oh, is Michigan on? I don't know where we are, okay? <laughs> Give me a break. <laughs> Oh, okay, I get it. We're on this side, okay. <laughs> okay, now I know where we are. Okay. <laughs> Let's go to the other side of Lake Huron. Okay, so that could be anywhere along the Michigan coast there, right? Or it could even be, if you go to the northern side of the lake, that could be still in Canada. Now, that's kind of vague. If I told you, let's just go to the other side of the lake, where are we going? You know, like, hey, let's go to the other side of Ontario. <laughs> Yay, <laughs> where's that? <laughs> I don't know that the disciples knew where they were going. But you know who did? Jesus. You know why I know that? Because chapter 5, you know, the, the, the story doesn't finish in, in verse 41. It, it continues in chapter 5, where it says, And they came over, look at this, unto the other side of the sea. And it kind of sounds like where Jesus said they were going. But look where they went, into the country of the Gadarenes. Now, I'm not going to read all through here. I'd have to read quite a bit to get the whole story. But 
<clears throat> if you know the, the this account, uh, we like to call him the maniac of Gadara. This is a man that is possessed with um, demons. And when Jesus asks the demon's name, they say, we are legion, for we are many. And I don't know how many demons were inside of this man. I do know that there was a herd of 2,000 swine that when Jesus cast the demons out, the entire herd went and drowned in the lake. I mean, this man has a serious problem. And Jesus knew it. The disciples did not. Jesus knew that he was going to reach this man. He knew he was going to heal him. And this man would come and Jesus would cast out the demons. And then the man would get cleaned up, clothed. And, and he would be sitting at the feet of Jesus just learning from him. I don't know how much time Jesus got to spend there. Several hours, I'm sure. Uh, it would have taken time for people to see the whole, this whole thing go down. And then go into town, gather people, tell everyone what's going on, come back out, and then, then be able to kick him back out of, of Gadara. But Jesus would only be able to reach this one man while he was there. But he knew that he had to reach this man. You see, <clears throat> everything that we're going to read here, that we're going to go through here in Mark chapter 4, was so that Jesus could get to that man. You know, everything that we go through in our life, God has a purpose. But God also has a destination in mind. You know, in each of our lives, when we, when we were born, and let me even fast forward from there, you know, when we, when we got saved, God didn't look down from heaven and go, what? He got saved? I don't know what to do with him. Uh, hey, why don't you just... Uh, you know, go this way, and I'm going to figure out what I'm going to do with you, and then I'll let you know in a little bit w which way, you know, just start walking that way, I'll figure it out. And that didn't happen to God. God has a plan for each of our lives. God knew us before he formed us in the womb. God knew us and had a plan for us before we were ever born. God has a plan for us as Christians. He has a destination for each and every one of us. Now, God has an eternal destination in mind for us, for God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now, God wants all of us to be in heaven. That's not going to be the case, unfortunately. That's our choice, whether or not we accept Christ as our Savior. And I, I hope that each of you in this room have. And if you haven't, don't leave today without doing it. But beyond that, as Christians, God has a destination in mind for you and me. God has a plan for our lives. God has something He wants us to do, somewhere He wants us to go. For Lily and I, right now, that is Brazil. God's destination, as far as He's revealed to us, is Brazil. I don't know if someday down the road God will move us somewhere else. That could be the case. Uh, but as far as I know, God is sending us to Brazil for the rest of our lives. <clears throat> God has a plan for each and every one of us. Now, God is not sending each of you to Brazil. Now, maybe someone in here, God will do that someday. But God has a destination for you. God never starts us in, a, in our Christian life without knowing where He wants to take us. Now, I think about Abraham. Well, he was Abram at the time, but when God came to Abram and and he called him out of his people, uh, out from among uh, that nation where he lived, and and he separated him. You know, he said, you know, I want you to leave your home. I want you to, I want you to leave your family. I want you to leave everything behind. I want you to hit the road. Okay, God, where are we going? I'll let you know when you're there. Yay. <laughs> Can, can you imagine trying to be a missionary and being like, we're raising support to go to the mission field. Where are you going? Well, God will let us know once we're there. <laughs> Man, what a hard, what a hard, that would be such a hard path to follow. But you know what Abraham knew and had faith in? God had a bigger plan, and God knew where he was leading him, even when Abraham couldn't see it. In our lives, sometimes we don't see where God is leading. All we can see is that next step. 
But you know, that's enough. If we understand that God has a bigger plan and God knows where He's taking us, then we can trust Him with that next step. Because even though it looks to us like a step in the dark, for God, it's just the next step along His plan to lead us where He wants us to be. You know, you can trust God with your destination. You know, we trust Him with our eternal destination. Why don't we trust Him with our earthly one? We can trust Him with our soul for all of eternity to keep us out of hell. But we can't trust Him to lead us in, in the way He wants us to go. God has a plan for us. Let's just take that next step. So, <clears throat> He looks at them and He says, Let us pass over unto the other side. And in verse 36, he says this. The Bible says, And when they sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship. I want to stop and just look at that phrase real quick. This is something that, you know, I've been reading the Bible most of my life, uh, pretty much since I could read. Uh, and I have read through this story, I don't know how many times. But I never noticed that. I, I, you know, I noticed they got in the ship and went. They took him even as he was. That phrase. I think it's interesting. You know, God never put anything in the Bible on accident. Everything's there on purpose. I think it's interesting that they took Jesus as he was, and God thought it necessary to mention specifically that that was the case. You know, in our lives, how many times do we try and take God into our lives but we try and make him who we think he ought to be we try and shape God to what we want newsflash God won't change God is God God is eternal and immutable he's unchanging he's the eternal one so when we take God into our lives we ought to just accept God for who He is. Well, how do I know who God is? <clears throat> well, He wrote us a whole book about Him. You know, the purpose of the, one of the purposes of the Word of God is so that we can know Him. Or spend time with Him. Amen. Get to know who God is and then learn to accept Him for who He is. Because He's never going to change. God wants to come into our lives and change us. You know, when we get saved, God wants to come into our vessel as He is because He's not going to change. And He wants to change the people that He comes into. Let God change you. Don't try and change Him. The next thing in this verse I notice is this. The next phrase it says, And there were also with Him other little ships. I feel like, you know, this verse in the Bible, I just, <clears throat> the whole verse I, I think wasn't there until recently, you know, <laughs> but when I was reading through the, and studying this passage of scripture, I, I mean, this verse just, both of these things were just kind of like, wait, that was there the whole time, <laughs> but they were other little ships. We read this story and we think it was just the disciples and Jesus in their boat. It wasn't. There were other little ships that went with them. You know, their decisions in the boat that day affected other people too. Their decision to try and solve the problem on their own instead of running to God first not only endangered them, but endangered those other little ships that were with them. There are other little ships in your lives. Children, co-workers, those in the world, your neighbors, there are other people that your decisions affect. And you may not see it, but there are ripples going out from your boat. And those affect the people around you. Don't forget that. When you want to quit and give up, remember there's some other little, little ships there with you that if you give up, if the disciples had just given up in this storm and 
they hadn't come to Christ and, and sought help from Him, not only would their ship have been lost, but the other ones would have too. You don't forget that. Life isn't something you do in a vacuum. <clears throat> Verse 37, And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. Right. So here are the disciples, they get in the boat and they head in the direction that Jesus said. They're doing what God has called them to do. And everything's going to be great. Except then a storm comes. Guess what? Storms are going to come in your life. Most of us have lived long enough to see them. If you haven't, hold on. Because <laughs> they're coming. <laughs> Yes, <clears throat> the storms come. And you know what the Bible tells us? If, that any who, that would live godly in Christ shall suffer persecution. You know, if you're truly living for God, if you're going to go out and, and take that next step of faith and follow the path that God has laid down in your life, if we're going to do that, there's going to be some opposition. There will be opposition. Even just our flesh, good grief. Man, how, how much does our flesh just fight us? You know, such a simple thing to go and, and hand a gospel tract to someone, an invitation to church. But it is so hard to do. Why? Because our flesh doesn't want to do it. Our flesh fights us. Even within ourselves, we have opposition. But beyond that, the world will oppose us. Satan will oppose us. And there are so many things that, that oppose the work of God. But can I tell you, God is stronger. Christ has already won the victory. <clears throat> you know, we say we're on the winning side. We're on the side that already won. It's not, a, it's not in progress that Jesus is going to win. He already won. He's just waiting to throw Satan in prison forever. He's just biding his time to seize the complete victory. He already won. He's been given all power in heaven and in earth. You know, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. When opposition comes which it will. Just remember who's in your boat. And he, Jesus, was in the hinder part of the ship. What was he doing? Man, he was pacing back and forth. He was afraid. Man, what am I going to do? The storm's here. I don't know what to do about it. Ugh, what are we going to do? No, Jesus found a nice comfortable pillow. And went and laid down and fell asleep. Why? Because he was so concerned about the storm. No. Christ wasn't afraid. <clears throat> That's the God that spoke the world into existence. He created the wind and the sea. You, know, you remember that little tidbit? He wasn't afraid of the storm. Because all he had to do is get up there and say... Peace be still. You know, if you're saved, Christ is in your vessel. He's in the boat with you. He's never going to leave. And He's not afraid of the storm. Hey, storms are going to come in your life. And you know, let me say this. I think sometimes we look at storms in our lives as Christians I think sometimes we have this idea that, well, if we weren't living for, you know, if we weren't following God, maybe the storms wouldn't come. You know, maybe this happened be just because, because I'm following God. It's part of life. It doesn't matter if you're following God or not. Storms are going to come. You know what the difference is? When we're following God... We're following the one who can calm the storm. I would much rather be in a storm knowing that I'm on, on the side of the one who's 
got power over that storm. They go through the same storm that's going to come in life. We're going to lose loved ones. We're going to have financial difficulties. These things happen. It's part of life. There are, there are ups and downs in, in the road of life. And, and we'll have some mountain peaks, but we're going to have some valleys. And I would much rather be in the valley with Christ than without Him. I would much be, rather be in the valley walking with God than having pushed Him away. Because I know he can handle the situation when I can't. But what did the disciples do? Here he is in the ship. He's not afraid. They came straight to him right when the storm started. Got him up. Hey, Jesus, there's a storm. You want to take care of it? No. That's not what they did. You know, they didn't come to Christ until they were afraid for their lives. How do I know that? Because they came and and it says... And they awake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? They come up and wake Jesus. Jesus, don't you care that we're dying out here? Okay, they didn't get to that point in a second. You know, it wasn't like, oh no, there's a wave, we're dying. Remember, these are sailors, experienced fishermen. They know the boat, they know the sea. So what's their first reaction? Oh, I can do this myself. Oh, I know this boat in and out. I know this boat like the back of my hand. I don't know if I could pick my hand out of lineup. I'll be honest. <laughs> that one's always confused me. But no, they here they are. I'm sure they start bailing. And man, they're trying to fix this problem on their own. It's like a little child who doesn't need their parents' help. You know, they're, they're trying to do something that is way bigger than they can handle you know they want to they want to carry it on their own you know and here's the parent you know i I can help you (laughs) no i can do this myself i can do this myself i'm a big boy you know i think sometimes we act like that to god here's god our heavenly father the one who has all power in heaven and earth and he's offering us help and like little children we we just want to do it ourselves. And then the storm keeps going and we start to reach a point where we realize we can't do this on our own. And we become afraid. <clears throat> and look what happens. When we try and fix our own problems, we get to a point Often, where we turn and point our finger at God and say, you don't even care about me. Let me ask you this. Does Jesus care about your trials? Yes. You know, Jesus even cares about a sparrow that falls. I am a birder, okay? That means I'm a person who likes looking at birds and... I keep track of every bird I've ever seen in my life, okay? When I see a house sparrow, I, when I see most birds, I'm like, ooh, look, it's such and such, you know. Man, cool. I could see that. I see a house sparrow, I'm like, oh, it's just another house sparrow. (laughs) I thought it was something else. (laughs) It's a disappointment to me. And, like, sparrows are just, they're sparrows. I mean, they're everywhere. They're kind of, they can be a nuisance sometimes. They poop all over your car, you know. <laughs> <coughs> They're just sparrows. But God cares even about the smallest sparrow that falls. Do you think he cares about his children? Do you think he cares more about his children? Do you think he cares about the storms in your life? Do you think he wants to help you? Yeah, he does. But how many times in the storms do we refuse his help? We want to do it on our own. And we bring ourselves to a point where we convince ourselves that God doesn't even care about us anymore. When the whole time he was standing over us going, you know, David, I could help you. You don't have to bear this on your own. You know what he tells us to do? He tells us to take his burden, his yoke. 
Why? Because they're light and easy. He wants to bear the load for us. And all it takes is us coming and turning to Christ and saying, Lord, I can't do it. Can you help me? And when they come and wake him, he just gets up and I can imagine him. He was taking a nice, comfortable nap. And he gets up there and he goes, Peace, be still. I'm sleeping down here. Just be quiet. Oh. <laughs> and then there was a little bit of calm. Is that what the Bible says? No, it says at the end of verse 39, And the wind ceased. And there was a great calm. You know, God can calm the sea in your life. When the storms come, God is the one that has the power to stop the storm. And He can bring a great calm. But we have to turn to Him. But sometimes God, in His infinite wisdom... When a storm comes in our life and we turn to Him and ask for help, God may choose not to stop the storm. But He's the God that can say, Peace be still to our heart. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Even in the midst of the worst storms in life, if we just turn to God, He can give us that peace. And the world will look at us and think, but you're going through so much. Maybe you lost a loved one. Maybe it was a parent, a child. How can you have peace and joy in that? only through God when the storms come which they always will God is still in control and God will either when we turn to him God can either stop the storm in our life and speak peace be still to the storm or he can speak that to our heart and soul but it's only when we turn to him he looks at the disciples and he says, and he said unto them, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? You know, as Christians, we have no reason to be afraid. There's no need for fear. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. You know, in the Psalms, it talks about you know, even though, though an host should encamp against me, sh still I shall not fear. We have no reason to be afraid as Christians. Why? Because we know our God is in control. Fear is the opposite of faith. If we're to trust God with that next step, you know what's going to have to leave? Fear. There is no reason to be afraid to take that step. You know why? Because God is in control. God loves you. God wants what is best for you and has the power to make it happen. So what are we afraid of? Are you afraid of what people might think of you? Are you afraid of the unknown? Are you afraid to take that step? Are you afraid that that you might not be, that the provision won't come? If we're following and obeying God and seeking His righteousness, He's promised to provide for us. That's the God we serve, and when He makes a promise, He doesn't make it unless He's going to fulfill it. And He's the one that can fulfill it. If I make a promise to you, I might break that promise. I might not have the power in me to fulfill it. But God always will keep His promises. Hey, God has a destination for you. He has a path set out for you. 
Are you following it? Or are you doing your own thing? Are you taking that next step in faith or are you afraid? Are you ready for the storm? Knowing that God is there with you? Maybe you're going through a storm right now. Why don't you just turn to Christ and give it to Him? I'm not saying your storm will stop. But what I am saying is God's got it handled. Just let Him handle it. I don't know what the path that God has put in your life is. Maybe you don't know either. Maybe you're like Abraham and you don't know where he's leading you. That's okay. It's okay not to know. But you know what's not okay? Not trusting God to take that next step. If God showed you a step, you take it in faith. There's no need for fear.